Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer and this is my walk time vlog, episode two, home chip fabrication and the innovator's dilemma. Now, one of my three favorite audio podcasts at the moment is the Amp Hour, hosted by Chris Gamble and Dave Jones. Now, the effect for me, anyway, when watching the show is it's pretty much like sitting around with a couple of mates while they're talking about really interesting stuff which would be cool, except the problem is that before the conversation started, they tied me up with gaffer tape, gagged me, chucked me in the corner of the room. So the end result is that they're sitting around there talking about things, and whenever something comes up that I want to have a say on, I've just got to go, mm, 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 and I can't get it out. Really, really annoying. So, one of the topics that I keep wanting to make comments on is this ongoing discussion between Chris and Dave about chip fabrication at home and of course they're going to go oh great so for those who haven't been following along at home the basic argument is that chris says that at some point in the not too distant future i think there's some time limit that's been set on it perhaps 30 years i can't remember we will have machines at home that will be able to fabricate integrated circuits and on demand so we'll be able to build our own electronics by just clicking a button and out it comes like a um, you know maker bot style dave says no it's never going to happen because the process of chip fabrication is so complicated um, and it benefits so much from economies of scale uses such exotic chemicals and things like that that it's simply not possible to take a chip fab scale it down into a little box and stick it in your lounge room. Now, the thing is that that is totally missing the point. When this debate first came up on the Ampower, I sent an email to um, Chris and Dave, pointing them to a book called The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. And I'm probably gonna do a terrible job of explaining this, but the basic premise of The Innovator's Dilemma is that when a new disruptive technology comes along, it doesn't have to be better than an existing technology in order to replace it. In fact, it doesn't have to compete with it directly at all. The value of a disruptive technology is not in leapfrogging an existing value network, it's in creating a whole new value network. Now that probably sounds like a whole bunch of gobbledygook. So I'll use a bit of an example. Think about what's happening at the moment in the world of computer hard disks and how at the low end of the market, by low end I mean um, small scale, low volume storage, everything is moving towards solid state drives. Now that is the end of a process that's been going on for quite a long time. And if you look back to the origins of the first consumer devices that use solid state memory, it wasn't competing directly with hard disks at all. So we've ended up in a situation now where solid state memory, like flash memory, and spinning hard disks are directly competing head to head at a certain point in the market. This is gonna get noisy truck coming, I'll have to stop for a second. That's better, trucks have gone. Okay, so um, think back to 10 years ago when flash memory was really exotic and really expensive, really slow, and it could handle maybe a thousand write cycles. And technically it was generally rubbish compared to um, a spinning hard disk. At that time you could not put them up against each other and have them directly compete. The dollars per megabyte, the raw performance, everything else, a spinning disk would win hands down. There's just nothing in the argument at all. The interesting thing is that flash memory started being used in totally different applications to spinning hard disks because it had different attributes, totally different values. And this is what I mean about the value network. The value of the flash memory was that it was very low power. It could be manufactured at a very low price point. Like you could manufacture like the actual bottom price to ship the smallest capacity um, spinning hard disk is quite high compared to you know a few dollars for a low-end flash memory. So when you're using it in an application like a video camera or the early digital cameras as it was at the time and MP3 players and 
um, early mobile phones and things like that, the benefit that you got from the flash memory was not that it was competing with hard disks in terms of being just as fast and just as high capacity, the value was totally different. So you couldn't really say one was better than the other because they were competing in totally different value networks. Now the interesting thing is that what follows from that point is after getting a foothold in this totally new value network, the disruptive technology, so in this case flash memory, can gain some economies of scale within that particular segment. So as digital cameras uh, became more popular, MP3 players took off, flash memory continues to be developed, it starts to gain the economies of scale, and it moves up the chain a little bit in terms of its performance. So for many, many years, it still cannot compete directly against spinning hard disks. And today, it still can't compete against spinning hard disks once you go over a certain capacity. However, right now, if you wanted to store, say, one gig or even 16 gig of data, trying to put a spinning disk into that application versus putting flash memory into that application, flash memory is going to win every time. So over time, the new disruptive technology continues to be developed and it starts to push out the old incumbent technology at the bottom end of the market and eventually uh, it just pushes out entirely and takes over. doesn't mean that the old technology is obsolete. What it means is that its value network changes and it will probably remain around for a very long time. I mean there are still people making steam shovels and there are still people making buggy whips and all of that sort of thing but that's no longer the mainstream dominant technology in the particular industry. So, this comes back to chip fabs. The point is, the value of being able to fab a chip at home is not that you can undercut some multi-billion dollar fab um, sitting in a, some overseas location which is turning out tens of millions of a, a particular design every day. The value of a home chip fab is something totally different. And right now I don't necessarily know what it is, but it could be that there are designs being printed on 3D printers that require some very rudimentary intelligence. And by intelligence I mean just very low level logic. And that's all they need. They don't need a 32-bit RISC CPU. And so what may well happen is that there is some application for being able to fab electronics on demand. And the other thing is that you have to consider that the form factor may be totally different. Don't think of it in terms of we're going to have a machine at home that turns out um, BGA packages, for example, because BGA may be totally uh, useless in the particular application. The form it takes may be to build the electronics as part of some physical structure, like coming out of a 3D printer, the logic might just be built into it. And so it doesn't look anything like what we think of as electronics today with uh, discrete parts sitting on a circuit board. It could be some kind of electronics you know, woven into the, the physical fabric of whatever is being printed. And compared to what we have today, it may be extremely low density, um, it may be very slow, performance may not be very good, but the point is that doesn't matter. It's appealing to a totally different use case, which is push a button and have a device come out that may be um, tuned to your specifications or um, it may be something that you've just dreamed up and no one else has done before. It may be something that is extremely niche, so it's simply not worth uh, rolling up a, um, a big production run. So anyway, my point is, Chris and Dave, you probably don't listen to me anyway, but at least now I can feel like I'm not just lying in the corner gagged, I can actually talk back. So thanks for the show, it's awesome, I love it, and I'll talk to you later. See ya.